Hey there folks, welcome back to Succinct Psychology, aka Psychsynced. My name is Jaya Hendrickson, and today I'm going to be starting out Chapter 9 in Principles of Social Psychology. Now again, I want to reiterate, as always, these slides have been pulled from the University of Minnesota Libraries, and they have been edited for presentational purposes. Alright, so Chapter 9 is going to focus on helping and altruism. And some of the topics we're going to be looking at more specifically are going to be understanding altruism, so the self and other concerns, uh, the role of affect, so moods and emotions, how the social context influences helping, and then finally other determinants of helping. All right, so altruism refers to any behavior that's designed to increase another person's welfare and particularly those actions that don't seem to provide a direct reward for the person that's performing them. Altruism occurs when we go out of our way to help people who have lost their homes as a result of natural disasters, such as hurricanes, when we stop to help a stranger on the side of the highway, when we volunteer at a homeless shelter or donate to charity, or when we get involved in a, to prevent a crime from happening. Every day there are numerous acts of helping that occur all around us. As we'll see, some of these represent true altruism, whereas others represent helping that's more motivated by self-concern. Helping is strongly influenced by affective variables. The parts of the brain that are most involved in empathy, altruism, and helping are the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, the areas that are responsible for emotion and emotion regulation. Though helping others can be costly to us as individuals, Altruism does have a clear benefit for the group as a whole. Remember that, in the evolutionary sense, the survival of the individual is less important than the survival of the individual's genes. Therefore, if a given behavior such as altruism enhances our reproductive success by helping the species as a whole survive and prosper, then that behavior is likely to increase fitness, be passed on to the subsequent generation, and become a part of human nature. If we're altruistic in part to help pass on our genes, then we should be particularly likely to try to care for and help our relatives. And research has found that we are indeed particularly helpful for our kin. People are more likely to donate kidneys to relatives than they are to strangers, and even children indicate that they're more likely to help their siblings than they are their friends. Our reactions to others are influenced not only by our genetic relationship to them, but also to our, their perceived similarity to us. We help friends more than we help strangers, we help members of our in-groups more than we help members of our out-groups, and we help people who are more similar to us more generally. It is possible that similarity is an important determinant of helping because we use it as a marker, albeit not a perfect one, that people share genes with us. Now while it seems logical that we would help people who are related to us, or people who we perceive as similar to us, why would we help people with whom we're not related? Well, one explanation for such behavior is based on the principle of reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism is the idea that if we help other people now, then they'll return the favor should we need their help in the future. By helping others, we both increase our own chances of survival and reproductive success, as well as helping people increase their chances of survival also. Over the course of evolution, those who engage in reciprocal altruism should have been able to reproduce more often than those who did not, and so this enabled that kind of altruism to continue. Reciprocal altruism means that people even may help strangers, based on the assumption that in doing so it can be useful because it may lead others to help them in the future. The principles of social learning suggest that people will be more likely to help when they receive a reward for doing so. Parents certainly realize this. Children who share their toys are praised, whereas children who act more selfishly are reprimanded. And research has found that we're more likely to help attractive rather than unattractive people of the opposite sex. Again, probably because it's rewarding to do so. Darley and Batson in 1973 demonstrated the effect of the cost of helping in a particularly striking way. They asked students in a religious seminary to prepare a speech for a presentation to other students. According to random assignment to conditions, one half of the seminarians prepared a talk on the parable of the altruistic Good Samaritan. The other half prepared a talk on the jobs that the seminarian children enjoyed the most. The expectation was that preparing a talk on the Good Samaritan would 
con prime the concept of being helpful for the students. After they prepare their talks, the religious students were then asked to walk to a nearby building where their speech would be recorded. However, and again according to random assignment, some of the students were told that they had plenty of time to make it to the recording, some students were told that they were right on time, and some students were told that they needed to hurry up because they were running a little late. On the way to the other building, the students all passed a person who was in apparent distress. This person was actually a research confederate. The person was slumped in a doorway, coughing and groaning, and clearly in need of help. The dependent variable in the research was the degree of helping that each student gave to the person who was in need. Darley and Batson found that the topic of the upcoming speech didn't have a significant effect on helping. The students who prepared a speech about the importance of helping didn't help significantly more than the students who prepared a speech on the other topic. But time pressure, however, did make a difference. Of those who thought that they had plenty of time, 63% offered help in comparison to the 45% who told that they were right on time and the 10% who told that they were running late. You can see that this is exactly what would be expected on the basis of the principles of social reinforcement. When we have more time to help, then helping is less costly and we're more likely to do so. So we see here in the graph we have green representing the Good Samaritan lecture and brown representing the job lectures. And we see there isn't a significant difference in the medium and high need for the participant to hurry, but we see in the low condition that the Good Samaritan le lecture did have a bigger significant difference from the job lecture. The outcome of reinforcement for modeling of helping is the development of social norms of morality, standards of, a beh of behavior that we see as appropriate and desirable regarding helping. One norm is that we're all aware of and that we attempt to teach our children is based on the principles of equity and change. The reciprocity norm is a social norm reminding us that we should follow the principles of reciprocal altruism. If someone helps us, then we should help them in the future, and we should help them now with the expectation that they will help us later if we need it. The reciprocity norm is found in everyday adages like, scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, and in religious and philosophical teachings, such as the golden rule, do unto others as you want others to do unto you. The reciprocity norm forms the basis of human cooperation and is found in every culture. Because the rule is normally followed, people generally do help others who have helped them. Helping as a result of the reciprocity norm is based on the expectation that individuals' help will be returned, so therefore it might not seem so much like true altruism to you. But we might also hope that our children internalize another relevant social norm that seems more altruistic, the social responsibility norm. The social responsibility norm tells us that we should try to help others who need assistance, even without any expectation of future paybacks. The social responsibility norm involves a sense of duty and obligation in which people are expected to respond to others by giving help to those in need. We've seen that the reciprocity norm teaches us that we should help others with the expectation of a future return, and that the social responsibility norm teaches us that we should do the right thing by helping others whenever we can without the expectation of a payback. And most of us believe that we should be helpful to others. The problem is that these goals may not always seem easy for us to follow because they represent a classic case in which one of the basic human motives other concern conflicts with another basic human motive, self-concern. Trying to do the best thing for ourselves in the short term may lead us to take the selfish road, taking advantage of the benefits that others provide us without returning the favor. Furthermore, we may be particularly likely to act selfish when we can get away with it. Perhaps you can remember a time when you did exactly that. You acted in a selfish way, but attempted to appear to others that you had not done so. All right, let's do a critical thinking exercise. I want you to try to decide whether these listed behaviors are or are not altruistic. I want you to consider your answer in terms of your ideas about altruism, but also consider the role of the person and the situation, as well as the underlying human motivations of self-concern and other concern. So first we have, Jill donates a pint of blood in exchange for $10. All right, then we have, Bill stops to help an attractive woman on the highway change a flat tire. Okay. 
Then we have, when Sherry renews her driver's license, she checks off the box that indicates that she is willing to donate her organs to others when she dies. Okay. Then we have, Kim volunteers once a week at a local soup kitchen. All right. And then finally, we have, George is a Buddhist and believes that true self-understanding comes only from selflessly helping others. Okay, so let's go back to the top. Jill donates a pint of blood in exchange for $10. Well, we already see that she's receiving something in exchange for what her donating a pint of blood, the $10. So we know this isn't a true altruistic act. Next, we have Bill stops to help an attractive woman on the highway change a flat tire. Well, we already discussed that people are more likely to help attractive rather than unattractive people because it is rewarding for them to do so. He may be thinking maybe he can get her number, or he may just be looking forward to the interaction with an attractive woman. So again, it's not out of altruism that he stopped to help her out. Next we have, when Sherry renews her driver's license, she checks off the box that indicates that she is willing to donate her organs to others when she dies. Well, when Sherry dies, she obviously can't receive anything in exchange for donating her organs. So this would be an altruistic act. Next we have, Kim volunteers once a week at a local soup kitchen. Well, this could be altruistic and it could not be. If, say, she was volunteering to improve her CV or her resume, well, then she was doing that volunteering for a reason, in exchange for something, to improve her resume or her CV. But if Kim just volunteered in her free time because she enjoyed helping at the local soup kitchen, then this would be an altruistic act. And then finally we have, George is a Buddhist and believes that true self-understanding comes only from selflessly helping others. Well, this one's a bit more tricky because he is saying that you should be selflessly helping others, but he's also saying that true self-understanding comes from it. So he's trying to achieve true self-understanding through selflessly helping others. So while he is selflessly helping others technically, he's also trying to achieve something for himself, true self-understanding. So it may not be a truly altruistic act. I don't need to tell you that people help more when they're in a good mood. We ask our parents to use their cars, and we ask our bosses for a raise when they're in a positive mood rather than a negative one. Positive moods have been shown to increase many types of helping behavior, including contributing to charity, donating, to, donating blood, and helping coworkers. It's also relatively easy to put people in a good mood. You might not be surprised that people are more likely to help after they've done well on a test or they've just received a big bonus in their paychecks. But research has found that even trivial things, such as finding a coin in a phone booth, listening to a comedy recording, having someone smile at you, or even smelling a pleasant perfume is enough to put people in a good mood and cause them to be helpful. But why does being in a good mood make us helpful? Well, there are probably several reasons. For one, positive mood indicates that the environment is not dangerous and therefore we can safely help others. Second, we like other people more when we're in good moods, and that may lead us to help them. And finally, and perhaps most important, is the possibility that helping makes us feel good about ourselves, thereby maintaining our positive mood. Although positive moods can increase helping, negative emotions can do so as well. The idea is that if helping can reduce negative feelings we're experiencing, then we may help in order to get rid of those bad feelings. One emotion that's particularly important in this regard is guilt. We feel guilt when we think that we or others we feel close to may have caused harm to another person. The experience of guilt increases our desire to create positive relationships with others. Because we hate to feel guilty, we'll go out of our way to reduce any feelings of guilt that we may be experiencing. And one way to relieve our guilt is by helping. Put simply, Feelings of guilt lead us to try to make up for our transgressions in any way possible, including by helping others. But what about other emotions, such as sadness, anger, and fear? It turns out that we may also be more likely to help when we're fearful or sad, again, to make ourselves feel better. Jonas, Schimmel, and Greenberg, and Piszczynski in 2002 found that people who were induced to think about their own death, for instance, when they were interviewed in front of a funeral home, became more altruistic. All right, folks, this is going to conclude my first video covering Chapter 9 in Principles of Social Psychology. I hope you guys learned some interesting stuff, and I'll see you guys in the next video.